All right, well, thank you, and uh, I'll probably speak for everyone here when I thank Shane Allier very much for his time today. He's a, a busy man, so I appreciate your attendance here today, Shane. And okay. uh, we'll start off with, a, with an easy one. You've okay. had a, a first quarter trading update out. Um, statutory net profit up 8%. Were there any stands out from that result for you? Oh, look, our result, you know, we're going through a transformation, and, um, you know, this was actually a pretty big year. It was a big year for me because it was my first year as CEO. So, um, there was a lot going on, and I think uh, our, our real strategy is about simplifying our business and picking a few things that we want to do better than anybody else. And um, that's not going to happen overnight, but I think we made a lot of really good start in the year. We sold some businesses that are no longer core to us. Uh, we've invested much more heavily in terms of our own digital transformation, and we're starting to get the results of that in terms of more more people choosing to bank with ANZ than 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 they have in the past. Now you've just returned from Europe, I'm yep. told, where you were meeting yep. some contemporaries on this very topic. Can you yep. tell us how that trip went and what you discussed? Yeah, well, it was a bit of a whirlwind. So in a week, we went to uh, Madrid, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, and Paris, and we saw a bunch of banks. And the reason we saw those banks and why we went there is look, essentially all large banks around the world are dealing with the same fundamental problems. And, and those are all the challenges. And the challenges are how do you embark on a digital transformation to meet the needs of your customers, uh, given the fact that most of our businesses are built on some sense of legacy platforms that are kind of old and different and not necessarily agile and don't necessarily allow you to, to, to create new product or respond at speed. And how do you make that transformation? And, and, and European bank, I mean, we could have gone to the US, but we went to Europe, uh, largely because across the continent, what you see is a dramatically wide set of different approaches to this. So at one extent, there are banks who are really quite passionate about not even talking about themselves as banks and thinking about themselves as technology companies and all the cultural transformations that come with that. And then at the other end, there are banks undertaking more, you know, kind of slower... Um, approach. But it was a really fascinating uh, uh, trip. I mean, I, I come back thinking, essentially, and this is a gross generalisation, but in Europe, kind of the further north you went, <laughs> the further north you went, um, the more kind of digital the economies are, and the more transformation you're already, you're already seeing. I would say Australia, if I compare where we are and our peer group, we're literally somewhere in the middle. And I know everybody always said, but we are. We're certainly not at the leading edge of that but we're certainly not at the, at the base either, and I think Australian banks are pretty well positioned for it. Where would you rate yourself among the Australian banks? Where would you put I mean, ANZ? Number one. I mean, oh, that was a, that's an <laughs> easy question. <laughs> well, why, I think why we would you actually, rate yourself look, I don't, look, I, I don't think any of the Australian banks are either uh, ahead or behind. We're, we're all, we've all got strengths, you know, and I can point, I won't, but I can point to the others and say where I think they do a really good job. They're a little ahead of us, but then I can look at things that we do differently as well. I think the big difference for us, and again, I'm horribly biased, but the big difference for ANZ is not necessarily about pointing to some app or capability or product. I, I think it is a cultural difference, and the fact that we've been prepared to you know, step to the left and the others are stepping to the right, we've been prepared to take a different approach to things like our approach to mobile wallets and others, that to me is what sets us apart. Um, even, even some of the recent decisions we've made about the way we price our card product and others really trying to be much more responsive to the customer, which is essentially what, hopefully, all the people in this room are really uh, here for, is about meeting those kind of unmet customer needs. Do you see yourself also trying to appeal to a younger demographic by employing this kind of technology? Um, yes, yes and no, although I think for us that would be a big trap to fall into. I mean, the reality is in Australia, you know, you have to, as a big organisation, we have to kind of go where the money is, you know, and, and, and where, where, are, where are the demands for the kinds of products that we have? And the reality is the vast bulk of the demand for the products we have are actually in an older demographic, you know, and 70% of the profit pool in Australia of banking is held by people who own their home. They may not have a mortgage, but they, they either own it outright or, 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 or who want to own a home. So that's sort of where the money is, and that tends to be slight, slightly older demographic. But inevitably, when you talk about digital, and you talk about mobile and all of those things, yes, it does kind of pull you down into a, a younger demographic, that's, that's, for sh that's for sure. Although I'm pleased to say that our, until recently, I don't know if it's still the case, but our, our oldest user of Apple Pay was, was 94 years old. So there's no, there's no age limit on people's ability to, to try new things. If you look at the curve, though, of the adoption of Apple Pay, I'd assume it's towards that, that younger... Yeah, I mean, the, the number one demographic there is 18 to 34-year-old male. And the reason for that by the way, is as much to do with Apple as it is to do with mobile wallets. I mean, there's a, there's a technology 
uh, aspect that seems to appeal to obviously in particular younger younger males. You sometimes see this sort of technology described as you know the Uber or the Amazon of mm. banking. Do you think would you go that far or or is it going to remain more niche? No, than that? I I wouldn't. Say, I think those things are interesting. I think we should look to. Um, those companies because they're, 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 they're setting expectations of consumers, you know, people, our daily digital life is set by companies like the Amazons and the Ubers of the world or Airbnb, etc. And so people then translate and say, well, if I can do that about booking a hotel room or booking a why can't I have that same experience in banking? But I think the idea that we would stand up and say, describe ourselves as the Uber of banking would be frankly ridiculous. And, and it's not something that we aspire to do, but that doesn't mean we can't learn from them. Is peer-to-peer -peer lending something you're looking at at all? Um, well, we sort of we, that's what we've been doing for 200 years, actually. Uh, we, we, we take <laughs> but, but deposits someone, from some peers over here. Someone more as a middleman. Yeah, than a, we stand in the uh, middle. Uh, so the model has changed, and the way to kind of you know take out the the, the middleman, to take out us, I guess. Um, no, it's not. We, we watch it obviously because it's an interesting. There's a there's a demand out there for the product. Of course, we look at it. Is it something we have a skunk works working on how we're going to get into the market? No. Um, I, I leave that to the people in this room. And, you know, I think there's, a, there's definitely a market for it. It'll grow. There'll be a place for it. Do I think it's going to overtake banking anytime soon? No. But I think they're complementary things. There are a lot of things in the financial sector that we don't do, and we live perfectly harmoniously with other parts of the, sec uh, you know, the financial sector, and that's how I'd see peer-to-peer. -peer. You mentioned you'd leave it to people in this room. Is a partnership in that area something you could look at? I think JP Morgan has partnered with On Deck that is running Yeah, so I was, I, was, I was saying to some of the people outside, actually, there's a slight, and again, yes, possibly, there's a slightly different uh, market structure in Australia as there is in the US in particular, and there's a really simple fact. In, in, in the US, the banks are overfunded. So the banks have too many deposits and not enough loans. That's a completely the reverse here in Australia. In fact, Australia, with a few, there's a couple of exceptions, is pretty unique in that. And so, you know, for every uh, dollar of deposits that we get as a banking sector, we're lending out $1.30. So we don't have lots of, t typically, that, uh, typically that relationship in the US is banks have extra money and so they, they go out and they, they, they invest, if you will, and they use it as a way to originate loans, uh, partnering with peer-to-peer. -peer. That's not immediately obvious as a solution here because, you know, we've got more than enough, we've got, we, 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 we're actually, the banks here are pretty good at originating loans, it's, it's, so we've got a reverse problem. Well, I have a question specifically yeah. on that topic right here from the floor uh, from Francesca, Momentum Media. Reports on mainstream media suggest ANZ is thinking of partnering with SME leader Muller. Would ANZ be hoping to achieve through a partnership like that? Well, I read about those things in the paper like everybody else. So, um, <laughs> no, look, I, as I said, we, you know, you can't shut yourself out of any potential partnerships. It's those things are about learning and, and, and accessing new markets, etc. cetera. Um, but as I said, peer-to-peer -peer lending is not something on the top of our list is that's the thing that we look at. You know, we, we think, and it was actually, I was listening to the team before, I mean, I, I think for us anyway, um, when you think about digital and the transformation, it's much more likely to be in the area of payments, which is a core function of what we do, helping people move money around. That's core to what we do, we're doing. And so any kind of digital transformation or partnership is much more likely to be in that sphere, I think, for us, for ANZ, I'm not speaking about for the sector, than it is in peer-to-peer in -peer lending. Okay. Uh, last question on peer-to-peer -peer lending, although because uh, we've dwelt on it. Um, is it a question of scale? Is it, is it just not big enough for, for a large organisation like uh, ANZ? I to think that is a very big factor in it. Um, you know, and that's where the opportunity is for people in the industry. You know, we're a large organisation. We have a balance sheet approaching a trillion dollars. You know, we, uh, we can only grow and add value for our shareholders by doing big things. And so, you know, there's a trap for large organisations, and that is the problem of complexity. The more little things you start doing, they drive up your operational risk. And it's very hard for large organisations to keep on top of those risks, and that's why they end up having problems. And so we're better off picking a few things and doing them well and letting other people, like yourselves, come in and complement that and, and be an active participant in the sector where it's appropriate for you. So I do think scale's an important part of it. I mean, I was listening to the gentleman before talking about, you know, and good luck, I hope they hit their targets about the amount of personal loans that they're writing. 
But again, when you think about the scale of what, what a big organization like we do, you know, we, we need to be thinking in almost in billions of dollars to be able to be, have an impact on our, on our company. Mm -hmm. You were talking before about um, some of the information technology you use. Mm. Um, is it influencing your hiring practices at all? I understand you've hired a recent former yeah. Google executive and yeah. some other interesting hires as well. Can you tell us a little more about those? Well, and as you do, uh, I need a little bit of help with this. Um, whoever handed it to me, I've managed to press a button. Um. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, continue. Yeah, no, absolutely. If you think about that, and, and actually, um, so my executive team uh, of a dozen people, just to give you the basic uh, demographics, about literally a third of them were people that were already there in the team. Uh, a third of them are people who have been promoted from within ANZ, and a third of them are from outside. And that's a pretty good mix. And the people that have come outside, actually, are, um, more or less none of them had ever worked in a bank before in a big commercial bank. And that's good because they come with different perspectives. They've worked in consumer goods companies or technology companies, etc. And so they bring a whole different uh, way of thinking about it. So yeah, it's really, I think it is really important. And it's important to get that outside thinking. It's important from a cultural perspective. I, you know, as we said before, uh, if, if our customers' expectations of us are set by Uber, we need people who live in that world. And you know, so yes, our head of digital came from Google, although she had 20 years at Procter & Gamble in a really strong marketing consumer goods company. Our new head of technology has only been with us a month, and Jared came with me last week to Europe. You know, Jared came out of Dimension Data, and so it's a, it's a kind of a you know, cloud services driven uh, background, but never worked in a bank. And I think that's really exciting to have those kind of skills in our team. Are you looking more at those skills now than purely financial graduates? Or uh, yes. Is it more, okay. I mean, actually, one of the big things that came out last week, I've, you know, interesting, all the banks we saw, every single meeting, with, we didn't ask it, every single meeting came up, the biggest challenge they're facing is talent. Whether that is just core, shortage, a perceived or a real shortage of software engineers, just as the shortage of engineering skills in, in, in Europe, and how do they, how do they fill that? Um, so that, uh, that issue, and, and to your point, the fact that, you know, banking, you know, we talk about digital businesses. Look, m most of us today, money, uh, to most of us, is already digital. It's been digital for ages. I mean, you know, there's very little coin and notes on circulation today in people's pockets. The way that you live your financial life today has been digital for many, many years. So we are in a digital, we've been in a digital world for a long time. I mean, you know, at ANZ, we move around in any given day, we're moving $200 billion, right? Five million transactions today, $200 billion moving around. You know, 99.9% .9 of that is digital. And, 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 and all we're doing is saying today that our customers, along with moving it around, want all sorts of other services that go with that in terms of being able to see where it is, understand, bring data with it, which is a whole MPP world. All of that comes about just enriching that experience of moving the money around. And that's why we, we, we need different ways of thinking about it. Now, the previous panel focused a lot on regulation. Yeah. Are there any regulations in this alternative finance sector that you see as being a challenge? I don't think they're a challenge. I mean, I think there's a challenge as an industry, and here in Australia, how do we encourage innovation? How do we make it, you know, the, the sandbox idea? How do we make it easier for people with good ideas to get started? Admitting that, you know, at some level, we're a small market with a small... Um, and, you know, scale is inevitably important in all sorts of businesses. Um, so to, to be able to give smaller companies a bit of a head start and get them started, I think is a good thing. There are some discussions already about kind of lowering some of the shareholder rules around, you know, starting a bank because there are, there are some, you know, percentage limits that make that hard if you're only small. So I think, you know, the regulation has a big role to play. Um, and it's always a balance. I mean, I'm not a regulator. Regulators have this kind of dual, you know, they want to encourage competition and, and make it easier for new people to come up with innovative ideas, but their ultimate responsibility is to protect the system and protect consumers in particular. Um, and, we, and we all know, not so much here in Australia, but we know globally what happens when things go wrong and, you know, the pain that can be felt in that. And so it's a, co it's a complex kind of balancing act that regulators have to take. And that's why I think actually some of the stuff that you know, I know people want to talk about reg, reg tech as well, and it's actually really exciting. And I have to say, as a, as a bank, in many ways, not totally, but in many ways, that's actually more exciting for us than perhaps fintech. So I, I have no issue with people wanting to compete and be in the fintech industry, and, you know, that's, that's fine. We want 
Uh, we, we want those people to do well. We want the economy to do well as a result. But the reg tech piece is really exciting for us because actually it's unlikely that my competitive advantage is that I do AML better than Westpac or my KYC process is faster than CBA. Maybe. I mean, it might be at a limit. But reality is, so we, you know, as us as being customers of people who can actually help us do those things uh, in, a, in a more digital, faster, more responsive way, it's, you know, and it's pretty exciting actually. It only enables us. Okay, I'll take another question uh, from the floor here. This is one of the most popular ones. Uh, Australia is the last developed nation on earth without a fully functioning comprehensive credit regime uh, due to bank inertia. When will ANZ share customers' data? Well, we already do share data, actually, and we, we share it. You know, if you're a small business today and you want to download your data and pump it into Xero or MYB, you can do all that. Um, the, I think the real big breakthrough actually is going to come with, there's a couple of things. One is with NPP, the new payments platform, which... You know, the first transaction on that is expected to be later this year. And that essentially allows, you know, enormously rich data to move around with all that money that, that we move. And uh, essentially that starts opening up data uh, to other people to add value to that data and add services to that. So that's coming soon. Secondly, as you know, the, you know, the government is keen and is particularly looking at the UK experience about these kind of open data to allow API access into bank data. And that's all fine. And... You know, I, we, I don't have a problem with that. Um, I, I can see that that can be a good thing. Our, our responsibility, though, is, you know, for 200 years, we've been in the business of protecting people's money, essentially. You know, you give us your money because you trust us, and we, you give it to us to look after, and when you ask us to move it somewhere, we're supposed to move it there on time to the right place. And, and, we do, and the industry does that pretty well. And now we're saying, actually, the data that goes with that is perhaps as valuable, perhaps, depending, as the actual monetary value. Uh, and so we have a responsibility, it's our customer's data, we are, we are a custodian of that data. We have a responsibility to look after it and protect it. And to, if customers want to move it somewhere, we have a responsibility to do that. That's actually, in, there's lots of opportunity in us doing that, but we do need to think about security and the way that that's undertaken. I mean. Um, it does open up new risks, and I'm not suggesting that that should mean we don't get into open data regimes, but it means we should be really thoughtful about it. And I know that people will criticise the banks and say we're trying to slow that down. I don't think that's the motivation. I think it is literally looking after our customers. You know, we all know people who have experienced uh, frauds and things, and imagine, in a, you know, if we, if we open up data too quickly, there, there, is, there is real risk here, and this needs to be thought through. So I think it will absolutely come. It's just a, you know, a matter of time. I'll open the questions to the floor in a moment, but I just wanted to ask you this, and everybody on Bloomberg TV gets this question okay. at the moment. What do you make of happening I, in the United States? I knew you were going to yeah. ask that question. <laughs> everybody gets it. <laughs> Dodd, um, Dodd Frank repeal, uh, the uncertainty around President Trump. Well, look, you know, I, um, all I can say is, you know, we're in the business of managing risk, and the reality is, and, and risk profile of the world is higher than it was, not, because of, not just because of President Trump, but, you know, we've been living in a pretty volatile and uncertain world now for at least 10 years, which is the global financial crisis. The nature of that uncertainty and volatility has kind of shifted, but it's still there, and, you know, our job is to help our customers interpret what those risks mean, and help them mitigate it, avoid it, make sure they price it correctly. But you know, it's 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 hard. You know, I wake you wake up any mo every morning. You know, having a look whatever's whoever's said what on Twitter, and you know, that's a different world. Uh, but it's also, I think, you know, without being silly about it, I think it's also indicative of this kind of faster changing world with more instant news and feedback, and and you know, people's opinions being shared really really quickly. That is the nature of the world we live in today, um, and whether it's President Trump or whoever, the reality is that you know that that uncertainty um, makes our life a little bit more interesting, a little bit more complicated. But our ultimate responsibility is to you know is to help our customers through how to deal with some of those some of those issues. Okay. Um, would anybody from the floor like to ask a question in person via microphone? Yeah, on this one. Show of hands. Oh, we'll, we'll go over to the uh, to this side first. And uh, is there a microphone that goes around, or are you just shouted out? There we go. No microphone on the way.
you just raise your hand again so we can find... Oh, here we go. Oh, we'll oh, start yeah, here. We'll come to you next. Here, <laughs> Shane, um, <coughs> I just want to ask a question about banking as a service. Are you uh, familiar of what BBVA's strategy is in the US around opening up their core banking system to foster more of an ecosystem, especially with your need to drive deposits? Is that something of interest to ANZ? Uh, yeah, I was with them last Monday, actually. Um, yes, I'm aware of it. Um, I don't think it's... Conceptually, yes. You know, again, one of the problems for, for any large organisation, it's fine to have good ideas and be conceptually right. You also need to have the right infrastructure to actually allow you to do it, right? And so what we're about at the moment is going through a bit of a phase of more kind of simplifying our own business, being really focused about those few things we do really well so that we can essentially renovate our core systems to allow us to be more responsive and more open for that future world. But, you know, is that going to happen tomorrow? No. But we're very, that's, that's exactly why we were in Europe last week is listening to banks thinking about how they're thinking about some of those things and trying to understand what's required to be ready for that kind of world. So I can absolutely see it coming, but it's not something where I can say, to, you know, today we are working on that profile. Right, and the uh, gentleman over here, here we are. Thanks, if you Shane. could just uh, state your name and position as well. I yeah, sure. Alex nice. Moody from uh, Moody Cadellan Partners. We're a, a, a finance broker in asset finance space. With a um, question around the sale of the Asanda book um, and your comments to um, non-core assets. Is, is leasing no longer core at ANZ? Well, that particular book was no longer core, and we do look at those things. So why? So what does that mean? By the way, it's a great business. Decent ROE, growing business, large, $8 billion assets. So we talked about it, was, it wasn't a matter of getting out of something small. But you go back to really basic things, which is, is it on strategy for us? There's lots of things we can do. We can lend money all over the place. The question is, we've got to figure out things that we can do better than anybody else. And we basically said we don't have a competitive advantage in lending money against cars through car dealers. We don't have any particular edge that we are better off, that $8 billion that we were lending over there, we are better off putting that, in, that money to work for our shareholders in years where we have a competitive advantage. So that was the decision there. The other thing that's interesting about that one is when you went and asked all those customers at Ascender that, in that particular portfolio um, who the relationship was with, it wasn't with ANZ. The relationship was with the car dealer. So that's not the business we're in. We're in the business of creating relationships. And so we said, they, they don't have a relationship with us, and we're pretty woeful at being able to convert those people into longer-term relationships with ANZ. So that's why we said it's off strategy. So there'll be other businesses like that, yes. But going back to something we said before, this, this inherent imbalance in Australian banks where we lend out more money than we take in deposits means that when you are lending it out, you better make sure that the money you lend out is going to the right place. Like it's on strategy and you're getting, and you're getting a decent return for that, right? Because the way that we fund that difference is we have to go and raise, we have to go and borrow money in the wholesale markets, which is expensive and has risk and all those things with it. And so we need to make sure that that's really worthwhile. And so we said we're better off putting it on uh, into things that are more on strategy. But there's nothing, we do a lot of leasing today of like, for example, we have a leasing portfolio of, you know, yellow goods to mining companies or whatever, or construction companies. We're still going to retain that business because it's, again, it's on strategy because what those people do with us is more than just one thing. Right, I think we probably have time for one more before we need to wrap it up. Uh, any last question from the floor? Looks like you're off the hook there. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah. I will say one comment though. <laughs> You do have a diversity problem in the industry if this is representative of the, t of the I business. I noticed that I, too. You know, yeah. I, <laughs> and, and on the basis that your customer base, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> will have a he heavy bias towards women who make a lot of financial decisions. That's kind of, it is just interesting looking in the room here and seeing um, so many men. But anyway, good luck with that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. And, uh, just, and again, just to finish, you know, I, I know we're a big company and I understand that, but the way that we, the culture at ANZ that we're building is we're, a, we're just a 200-year-old startup. And, and, you know, I, I look at our market share and it's important to, in, in our mind, we have 15% market share. That means 85% of the market is not with me. So we wake up every morning thinking of ourselves as small and interested in the other 85, yeah? And I absolutely have no issue with any of you coming after us and wanting to eat our lunch and take away business from us, that's fine. I have no issue with that. You know, a, a dynamic 
innovative, competitive industry is actually in everybody's interest. And that may sound like I'm just saying it's true. It is in our interest. There are businesses, going back to the question of, there are businesses that we're not the best play person to provide. It might be in the personal loan space, it might be in leasing, I don't know. That's fine. It might be in certain payments. That's good, that's the nature of any vibrant industry. And you know, we, we see that all the time in other industries. We don't, big banks don't have to hold on to everything. Right? And I think the idea of working in partnerships is inevitable. Now, I don't know if it's peer-to-peer -peer lending, but in general, in fintech, working in partnerships absolutely will be the case. Where we, 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 have, we have something that, with all due respect, you don't have. We have customers. We have five million customers here in Australia alone. You don't. You want them. I understand that. You have something we don't have. You have good ideas, and you have new technology, and you have better ways of doing things. And so there is a natural way of trying to figure out how to, how to work together to do that. But anyway, good luck to everybody, and thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.